So thank you for joining us. My name is Susan Bowden and I am the, the Digital Outreach Coordinator for the Conservancy. You are here for a virtual lecture tonight. This first slide that is up is reminding you of a few other virtual lectures that we have either had. Uh, for example, on January 25th, the Fetterman Archaeological, Archaeological Preserve virtual lecture series, uh, we released a new virtual uh, visit to that preserve. And then coming up in March, April, and May, we have a few more that are going to be coming out, and we want to make sure that you know about those and know how to get registered. You'll see registration information on our website and also on Facebook and other social media soon. Tonight, during the webinar, we're hoping that the, the Zoom will play nice. Um, please use that Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, that's the best way for you to, to let us know that, that you have questions. We will have a Q&A time with Davina. Um, after she's finished pre presenting. If you have technical difficulties, I would say I would refer you to Facebook, but right now that's not working. We're going to work on it. Um, there will be a recording that will be available on our website and also up on um, you YouTube sometime tomorrow or the next day that you can also refer to. So there are lots of options for you if you need to step away and not watch live tonight. So with that, I would like to introduce you to our speaker this evening. And uh, I'm really, really pleased that she's with us. Uh, Davina is uh, coming to us from Arizona. Davina Tubers is, is Navajo. She is originally from Bird Springs, Arizona, which is very near uh, the location of uh, the research that she's doing. She's researching in the old loop boarding school in Arizona, which started out as a federal Indian boarding school and then was converted to be a Japanese isolation camp during World War II. Uh, she has got some really interesting research that she's doing. She's at Arizona State as a postdoc fellow. And with that, I think Davina, you probably ought to take it over from me so that you can tell everybody about the, the research that you've done and um, we can ask some questions. So thanks for being with us. Let me stop my screen share so you can take over. Yad eh? Shit, Davina, two bears, the initiate, taught a cheatney initially, taught cheatney, bushes cheat, city taught dent, nasha. Hello, I'm Davina, and I am originally from Bird Springs, Arizona, and my clans are Bitterwater, and I'm born for Red running into the water clan, and um, my um, Shiche is. Um, Tabahi and my um, Nali is um, my paternal grandfather is also bitter water. So I come from the community of Bird Springs, Arizona on the Navajo reservation and it is on the southwest part of the Navajo reservation. I grew up both on and off the reservation and I um, worked for a long time as a tribal archeologist and program manager of the Navajo Nation Archaeology Department. And through my work, I learned about the Old Loop Boarding School, or I visited the Old Loop Boarding School historical site. But I also learned about it from my grandparents, my maternal grandparents. And they, um, my maternal grandparents, both went to school at the Old Loop Boarding School in the early 20th century. And as I started grad school, um, I really wanted to get my PhD because I wanted the freedom to research important places on the Navajo reservation, um, you know, in-depth research of these important places. Um, and that's why I decided to go back to school and get my PhD in anthropology and archaeology. And um, I just want to give you um, some background information about uh, my research of the Olu boarding school. And there has been a newfound uh, interest in Indian boarding schools here in the United States, as well as um, Canadian residential schools, because of the fact that there were um, unmarked graves of children discovered at um, near Canadian uh, res Indian residential schools. And so that sparked this whole um, media uh, frenzy 
regarding uh, Canadian Indian residential schools, and then that slowly trickled over into the United States. And the Secretary of the Interior, Deb Holland, has ma made it her initiative, initiative. She's the first Native American woman to serve in that position, Native American to serve as the Secretary of Interior. And so she made it her um, goal to um, have uh, you know this research done on the 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 history of boarding schools. So this happened after I began my research, or after I completed my research on the old loop boarding school. And this, I'm very grateful now that there's this interest in federal Indian boarding school history in the United States because this really is a chapter of American history that has gone ignored and unacknowledged for so long and and it is something that i think in our country we're beginning to realize there are a lot of there's history of marginalized group that that needs to be told and that also includes japanese incarceration uh, japanese american citizen incarceration on indigenous lands during world war ii so these are very important stories that that you know histories that you know, that we need to learn about in this country because they have been silenced. So this map here just shows shows you where um, federal Indian boarding schools are located across the country. These ones are off the reservation, and if you go to the National Native American Boarding School um, website. Uh, they have a, a map that they have where they accumulated um, data of over 500 in federal or Indian boarding schools, most of which are run by the federal government in the United States. So um, this map here, it just it it doesn't represent the hundreds of boarding schools there were in the United States in the early 20th century. And when you think of boarding schools, you know, the federal Indian boarding schools were something different. They were for the assimilation of Native American children and the dispossession of indigenous um, lands, you know, taking children from families, um, literally taking them um, when they were like five years old. And in fact, you know, I learned about um, the loop boarding school for my grandparents because my grandmother told me the story of how she was taken from her family when she was only five years old. So you see here on this map, the um, the federal Indian boarding schools that were actually built on the Navajo reservation. And all of, oops, all of these schools were built in the early 20th century. And they had a very uh, strict um, way of dealing with children because they were assimilating them into American society. And they, the like federal government um, took children from families. And sometimes families would voluntarily take their children to these boarding schools for their you know, different reasons. But like I said, in my grandmother's case, um, her father was threatened by po the police, and they told her her father that if he doesn't take her to the loot boarding school, that he would be thrown in jail. So this happened, you know, not just to the Navajo people, but many, you know, many different tribes across the country for forcibly taking their children. And once they arrived in boarding school, it was a very harsh militaristic environment that they were um, taken to. And they uh, they could not go home um, during the school year for nine months. And that was the case at the Olu boarding school. <clears throat> Children there uh, could not go home. Um, however, their, their families were able to visit them at the school. Um, I collected oral history about um, these uh, grandparents who visited their children or their grandchildren at the old loop boarding school, but they would park uh, away from the school uh, behind the um, eight foot high 
earthen dike that was built there because of the flooding at Olu, they would park behind that um, earthen eight foot high dike and they would visit their grandchildren and feed them uh, Navajo food like uh, mutton. And they would also bring watermelon from their fields for the children to eat. Um, and they parked out of uh, sight of the school or out of surveillance and um, visited their granddaughters there. So um, at these schools, the children were forced to um, attend church every, every Sunday and also during the week. And at Loop, that was the case as well. There was a Presbyterian church at Loop. And, um, and um, Loop was actually opened in 1909. And um, again, my grandparents uh, told me stories about this place and that's how I knew of its ex existence. And when I was young, um, they told me stories like my grandmother about basically how she was bullied by older girls. She was forcibly tattooed by the older girls at Loop. They would practice their tattooing skills on the little girls. And, um, but she also told me a story about how she would take care of my grandfather and watch out for him because, um, she thought she was related to him and he was small for his age, even though they were both the same age. And she thought that he was younger than her and related to her. But these stories just emphasize this, um, this way that children looked out for one another, but they also had, you know, bullying there at the school. And they also, you know, were very much punished for um, speaking their language. And this is a this is what you hear over and over again with regarding boarding school history by you know many tribes. I mean these schools were um, assimilating children and they were providing them with a vocational education. So this, this map here I found in the National Archives of in Washington, D.C., and it is a map of the old Loop Boarding School um, campus, I guess you could call it. And uh, Loop is located about 45 miles away from Flagstaff, Arizona, and about 25 miles away from Winslow, Arizona. And at the time, it was also about 18 miles away from the Sunshine um, Railroad Station. And so the actual school opened in 1909. Um, I don't know if you can see my little arrow or cursor, but this building in the center that says dormitory, that was the first building that was built at Loop. It was built in 1909 and these structures were made of local sandstone. So today this whole area consists, is currently a historical archeological site. It was raised, bulldozed to, um, you know, bulldozed flat in uh, 19, uh, six, around 1966, according to one of the interviews I did for my research. So at this, at the campus, um, there was a lot of um, new construction or quote new construction in, in the 1920s. And so they had built also uh, a school building in 1923. So the first building that was built in 1909 was both the school, the dormitory, the dining hall, everything was in that one building. And then the next uh, building they built was the a school in 1923, which um, is located behind or um, south south uh, west of the uh, first building, the original building. And then they also built a uh, larger dining hall, a separate building here to the southeast, and that could accommodate feeding 400 students. So as a result of this construction in the 1920s, the population or the student enrollment came up to about 400 students in um, the late 1920s, which was the highest number of Navajo children that went to school here. 
So a lot of this history isn't known because that was another reason I decided to focus on the Olu boarding school because, um, you know, the boarding school's name is mentioned in like different books, but it it's Navajo history as a boarding school had never been documented before I wrote my dissertation. And, and that's the reason why I want, wanted to do this research. And I hope um, to, I want to, I will publish a book. I need to tell myself, but I will. And, and uh, on my dissertation research, because I want, you know, our Navajo people to know about their local history and um, as well as, you know, great, the greater American society. Um, if you, there was also a hospital at built in the 1920s um, here you can see it. It's also to the southwest, the hospital there. And then again, there was a Presbyterian church that um, began as soon as the school opened in 1909. Then the church, uh, Presbyterian church, was built in 1912. And then um, there again, um, a trading post. All of these, at a lot of these. Uh, boarding schools on the reservation, That's those are the things that were usually there, the school, a trading post, a church, a hospital that would be for the use of um, the children as well as uh, the local communities, Navajo communities. So in this map, which is was drawn in 1941, what's really interesting is that you see this this um, fencing, these lines with the X here, and it covers the, um, I guess, the heart of the Loop Boarding School campus. So it encloses the original building that was built in 1909, the school that was school building that was built in 1923, and the dining hall. You can see that the fence goes around it. And actually, in the corners of this map, also um, in the corner of these, this hand-drawn fence line was um, it's it says tower. So this was the um, fencing of the. I believe that it was the fencing around the Loop Isolation Center camp that was there in that was there in 1943. And the towers um, were where the military had built towers in each of the corners and stationed um, the, the military men there with their guns to watch over um, Japanese American uh, prisoners there and the Loop Isolation Center. So I'm, I'm just, showing you this map to give you an idea of what it looked like around um, the north and east side of the main part of campus were the housing for staff. And then um, on the west side, you can see the mission or the Presbyterian church and more houses uh, for the staff. And today at the Loop um, historical site, only two buildings remain. And the reason why they are um, still there is because the there were Navajo families that moved into those houses. So when the Bureau of Indian Affairs came in the 60s to bulldoze everything, they didn't bulldoze those two houses because their Navajo families had moved into them. Um, to the far um, right of the screen, you can see um, here it says dike, and that refers to what I was talking about, the eight foot high earthen dike, because the little Colorado River is very close. I mean, the government built this federal Indian boarding school in a floodplain, and the little Colorado River used to flow to the, to the um, east and north of the um, the school grounds, and that's why they built these um, eight foot high earthen dikes uh, on the west side of the school to prevent the flooding. But the flooding, the river channel changed. I mean, the little Colorado River began to um, really flood.
flood the school and the elders that I interviewed remembered being, you know, taken out of school in the middle of the night and having to cross, cross the bridge that was um, really close by um, and be taken to other schools while there's, while the old Luke boarding school uh, floodwaters went down and the school um, got cleaned up and dried out. So it's really um, interesting as well that um, there was a, a lot of health issues with the children at the boarding school because, and I think the flooding exas exasperated the uh, health issues, which were tuberculosis and also trachoma, which is an eye disease. And um, also interestingly, the the sewage at Little Sink or at the Old Luke Boarding School, the sewage lines ran directly into um, the pipes ran right into the Little Colorado River. So when there was flooding, you can just imagine like all of the sewage backing up and and having you know this um, sewage wastewater flowing around the schools and you know complicating or making the health problems of the children even worse because um, of of this unsanitary um, uh, sewage that that probably backed up during the floods and indeed when um the the Luke boarding school closed in 1942 um they had some testing done of the water uh while the um internment camp was there in 1943 because i think some of the military police were getting sick and they blamed it on the water and that that also was the case when um um from the teachers and staff that were working at the boarding school um, that they would blame the water because they were they were thinking that was making them sick but anyway the tests that they did they did find um you know contaminants sewage in the water when they were testing the drinking water at, at the olu boarding school um these are just pictures to give you an idea of what the campus looked like. And this was the original school building I, I said in 1909. So these are this is where um, um, the Japanese American men were probably staying because this building here um, in the 1920s, it, it be became the dormitory. So it no longer had you know the dining hall and the, the classrooms or it was no longer used in that way. It just became the dormitory. So this is where um, the Japanese American men would, I guess, sleep. And um, one of the Japanese American uh, prisoners there, um, Mr. Harada, Dan Harada was an artist and he used to go to this building or the second floor of this building which was added on in the 1920s. So you, you don't see a second floor in this photo because it's an earlier photo, but in the 1920s, they did add a second floor to this building. And Dan Harada talks about going up onto the second floor and actually painting landscapes of um, um, the, the view of the uh, San Francisco peaks there to the west, which, um, you could clearly see. So this is the school building that was opened in 1923. And one of the photos taken by Harry Bueno um, pictures um, him and his friends in front of the 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 gate, um, the opening here. So both of these buildings were almost similar in the fact that they had um, openings on the north um, the north side of the building. So this original building in 1909, the opening was big enough to where you could drive a truck through. And it also had another um, opening on the south side. And um, inside that courtyard there, um, that's where the children would play. And the school building that was built in 1923 also had a courtyard in the center. And it also had a north facing door which ironically is in Navajo culture um, taboo because we in our hogans, 
we always put the doors, the door facing east and uh, the north face door is um, symbolic of death. And so if you just think about that and you know how it must have affected the parents and the children to know that the doorway of these you know institutional buildings was facing north it, you know that that kind of effect that could have had on their mental health um in this picture you see the hospital and you see the back of the school building that i just showed you this one here the this is the back of that school building it's a long um long uh, like hallway with classrooms and at the end of that was um um like um i guess you could say an auditorium where they had a stage and that's where they would ch show children movies um they they would show like westerns and tarzan movies and my grandmother said she used to watch may west movies there and you see the hospital here as well um it's on stilts and so you know they they under they obviously built it on stilts because it was ha they were having pro continuous problems with flooding and as you can see the little Colorado River there um, behind the hospital is very, very close. And um, that was when the the channel of the little Colorado River changed, like I said. This just gives you an idea of um, the the way it looked out there back then. I mean, the the be the the buildings were very beautiful, and my my paternal grandfather was very upset that they just totally bulldozed those buildings down. Um, in the 1960s, and he didn't understand why, you know, they would just tear up down those buildings and they never reused them. And um, the large uh, building, two-story building um, here is what was called the clubhouse, and that's where a lot of the teachers used to live. And then again, you can see the um, Little Colorado River flooding back there, the, the, the waters back there. Another picture again, um, facing north and then the little Colorado River again uh, in the background there. So this, this picture here shows, um, this would have been where the Japanese American men would have been staying. Again, this is the original building built in 1909. And this is the powerhouse because um, the whole boarding school was powered by coal and Navajo men were hired to bring coal to the school through um, their wag with their use of their horse and wagons every day they would bring coal um, from the sunshine train station that was 18 miles away and burn the coal in the school or in the powerhouse to provide heat for the school so the the like I said the vocational education um, offered for um, children were, were to prepare them to become the laboring class, you know, not to become um, scientists and lawyers and engineers. So girls were basically taught how to be homemakers, you know, sewing. And it was very surprising to me to, me to find out that they actually did teach Navajo weaving at Loop. I heard it from the elders and I was really surprised by that. Um, because, um, you know, I thought they wouldn't be teaching that kind of curriculum the, of Navajo culture. And the elder said in this space alone, they were allowed to speak the Navajo language with their Navajo teacher, Mrs. Martin. And this photo I found um, after I had interviewed the elders, I went to the National Arc or the Navajo Nation archives in Window Rock, Arizona and looked at their uh, Milton Snow collection. Um, he was a governmental photographer in the early 20th century on the Navajo Reservation. I found these beautiful photographs of the children at Loop. So this is this is what um, this photo is depicting. Here's another photo that I found in um, the Navajo Nation archives that was taken again by Milton S Snow in 1939 at Loop. And the child, the boys also received a gendered vocational education. And these are some of the uh, things 
you see on the side that some of the um what they were being taught like carpentry and farming and sometimes they worked in the hospital so half of the day they were were in school and then the other half of the day they were doing learning um you know had their vocational education and a lot of the older students were actually retained um, so you had students there from the age of five all the way up to age 21, even though the school only went to the eighth grade, um, the, the boarding school would retain the older students so that they could um, provide the upkeep of the school and they, they would get criticized by inspectors for um, government inspectors for doing that because they weren't providing an education for the older students, rather they were just making them work in the farm or, you know, doing other um, things to uh, um, upkeep the school rather than to actually get an education. So one of the problems with Loop was that, it, like I said, it kept flooding. And so it was costing the government a lot of money. The Department of Interior wanted to close Loop down and the um, um, the the Navajo um, educate education um, superintendents did not want the 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 loop to close down because you know it was providing education for students and also if they closed down the school they would have to close down the hospital and that was you know a very it was very important to have these services for the Navajo people and so. Um, even though it was costing a lot of money because of the flooding that you see here in this photograph, um, you know, the, the, the superintendent um, and, and the Navajo agency official does not want the school to close down, but there were going to be budget cuts. And so it was decided that the school should close in 1942. And then um, it was also, um, you know, considered um, at that time as well, the War Department started talking to the Department of Interior and wanting to um, use, utilize, reutilize, or repurpose the school as for some, you know, there was different ideas of what it would be used for, but those ideas all had to do with the incarceration of Japanese uh, American families and or, um, you know, for that purpose, for, for imprisoning Japanese Americans, that, that there were talks of even maybe having it be used as a quote unquote university for um, um, Japanese American prisoners that were being in incarcerated during World War II. So there were all kinds of ideas that were, you know, in the archives, we found letters being written um, about this, about what to do with Luke, but with regards to the, um, in, um, you know, incarceration of Japanese Americans that was happening. So I'm, I am, am going to be publishing a book chapter with my colleague, Hannah uh, Mariyama, at the University of Connecticut, and that should be coming out in um, this year. This this year, we've we're just um, almost, you know, we've got everything done. The editors looking at it, and we just got final um, one more uh, final stage, uh, and then the book will be published this year. So we have been working on that article for a couple of years now, and. Um, I'm really excited that, that that we finally that that book is finally go going to be published. And um, what's really interesting is you know that there's a lot of uh, overlapping of uh, you know what happened to Native Americans and um, Japanese Americans as far as you know the oppression of of marginalized peoples in this country. Um, this this photo really quickly is just how um, 
it looks out there today from the site of the old loop boarding school, you can clearly see again, the San Francisco peaks and also the um, little Colorado river. That's how it looks today. When they bulldozed the, the um, old loop boarding school in the sixties, they pushed a lot of the debris to the edge of the little Colorado river. And so it's slowly, you know, eroding into the, the to the riverbed. And this is how the site looks out there today. There's no marker, there's no historical markers. There's people that live there um, basically on site. Um, a Navajo family, um, like I said, uh, lives in the super in, uh, intendant's house and has been um, renovating it. But this is how the, the landscape looks. And um, you can definitely see a lot of historical um, artifacts or, or trash out on the land. And this site has never received a site number. So it has actually not been recorded by archeologists. And I'm going to be working on doing that with a couple of colleagues of mine and also doing oral history interviews about the um, Loop Isolation Center history from a Navajo perspective. And this building just gives you an idea of what the buildings may have looked like. This is, um, they were all made of this red local sandstone. Um, there's um, a lot of information in Washington, D.C. And I, you know, archival information, when I was reading through the boarding school archival information, I came across a lot of correspondence not about the um, boarding Navajo boarding school educational history, but within those documents, there was um, a lot of correspondence about the loop isolation center being established at the boarding school. And this the boarding um, the boarding school closed in 1942. And a lot of the elders that I interviewed, they didn't understand why their school was closed. Um, they would, three of the elders, Ardith Curley, uh, Pope Parison, Gertrude, Hyjo, they talked about how they actually went back to Loop in the fall, thinking they were gonna go back to school in um, 1942. And they were told, your school is closed. Um, and they didn't understand why, because, you know, the school had always, you know, had been there for a couple of decades and um, they, they wanted to go back to school and they never went back to school after loop closed because um, their parents didn't want them to, um, you know, go to a different school because it would be too far away for them to travel and Loop was, you know, much right there in in the uh, Navajo community community and easier to um, get to. But in 1943, um, or not, I'm sorry, in 1942, the the um, the decision was made to close Loop, and um, you know, first it was because of um, the reasoning was because of budget cuts and the fact that there was, you know, a lot of flooding. And then it became, you know, the, the war department um, had an interest um, in loop and reutilizing the boarding school for their purposes. And the Navajo Nation Council, which is, um, um, you know, uh, similar to the U US Senate, they, they passed a resolution in 1942 to um, allow the government to use the boarding, the loop, specifically the loop boarding school for, um, you know, for, to help in the war, wartime efforts. And, but it, it does, the archival records, we we haven't really been able to find much more than that resolution. Like we didn't find more correspondence with the Navajo, um, actual Navajo governmental people. Um, most of the correspondence were between the non-Navajo, um, like the Navajo agency 
and the Commissioner of Indian Affairs and the Department of um, the, Se the Secretary of Interior and the Director um, um, of the, the uh, War um, Relocation Authority. And so the, the, the correspondence were not bet between the Navajo governmental officials. So, you know, that's something that we keep looking for. We keep looking for like, did, did the um, you know War Department actually talk to Navajo um, individuals? We can't find. We haven't found evidence of that. And <clears throat> but we do have a copy of the resolution allowing um, the War Department um, or giving the War Department um, permission to use the Loop Boarding School that the Navajo um, resolution. Navajo Nation Council passed that resolution in 1942. And so, um, and and after that, there were appeared in like the local newspapers, these um, little snippets of, of how this, the old um, boarding school was going to be used as what they call it an internment camp. And <clears throat> um, the loop, isolation center um, was for the purpose of imprisoning troublemakers. So, you know, Japanese American families were already taken to these, you know, concentration camps located all over the West. And now they were being further um, isolated, the men who were quote unquote troublemakers. And it was just, you know, if there were like, men that were trying to find out why they were being taken away from their homes and put in these um, camps and questioning or also fighting for their rights, fighting for, um, you know, trying to um, be treated more fairly. And also, you know, these were the reasons why they were termed troublemakers um, and and then sent to loop. So um, one of the more famous um, Japanese um, American prisoners at loop was Harry Ueno and and he was at Manzanar and um, accused of being one of the um, instigators of the quote unquote Manzanar riot. And so he, uh, was sent to uh, Moab first, Moab, Utah, and then um, him and um, five other Japanese American men were um, put in the back of a pickup truck in a wooden like coffin that was five foot by six foot and three foot high and had to endure, um, you know, over 400 miles in, in, those cramped quarters and taken to loop um, uh, on the Navajo uh, reservation. And um, <clears throat> so, you know, the, the, the men that were in prison here, they had no due process. They had no idea how long they were gonna be at loop. They were separated from their families, you know, just as Navajo children were separated from their families you know, these Japanese Americans, um, you know, Japanese American citizens, American citizens imprisoned here at the Loop Isolation Center with over 150, you know, uh, military men watching over them in this barbed wired um, encampment at the Loop Isolation Center. They had no um, due process. Um, the Navajo people, my grandparents, uh, my grandmother used to talk about how she felt sorry for these Japanese men and, uh, and how the Navajo people felt like they felt sorry for them because they think they thought that, that there was no reason for them to be there and, you know, why they felt the injustice, I guess, of, of having these, these men in prison at Loop. And she shared that, you know, sometimes they would bring food and give food to the Japanese um, um, prisoners there. 
And, you know, this, they, they weren't supposed to interact, you know, the, the um, archival information, you know, set, um, states that, you know, there shouldn't have been any interaction between the Navajo people and the Japanese that were imprisoned at the Loop Isolation Center, but um, there's these little stories, and I want to interview more Navajo people to through my project to learn more about this history as well, but the Japanese American um, men learn how to say yat e hello, and they would say hello or yat e to the Navajo people that would walk walk by because because the loop trading post was still open and it was right right um, just south of the boarding school basically on the boarding school campus and so that trading post didn't close down until you know the 1980s and and so Navajo people kept going to the trading post and they would see you know the Japanese American men there and one of the elders I interviewed, Hope Harrison, she actually said that she remembers having a picnic where the Japanese um, prisoners were there um, eating with the Navajo people. So that that's one of the unique oral histories um, that, you know, when I was interviewing, interviewing elders about the Navajo boarding school history, she told me this little bit of um, history regarding the um, the Japanese um, isolation center there at Loop. And, <clears throat> um, but, you know, for the most part, um, that that's gonna be an area where I'm I'm going to um, be conducting interviews because, I, uh, because the Loop com community expressed to me when I was giving my, um, my presentation about my dissertation research at the Luke chapter meeting, they wanted they they wanted to know more about the Loop isolation history and the imprisonment imprisonment of Japanese American men. They expressed that interest, and that's why I'm I'm going my my next phase, I guess, of research at Old Luke Boarding School will be on this Jap Japanese isolation center history. So 70 men from all, you know, a total of 70 men from the other Japanese um, incarceration camps were sent to loot. Some of them were sent, you know, be, by accident just because they had a similar name to, you know, another person and they were accidentally sent to loot. Um, there was a director there, um, uh, Ray Best, who, is remembered as being not very nice to the Japanese men. However, the next director, Paul Robertson, that came after um, um, about three months after um, Ray Best, he had previously um, in his job with um, um, the state agricultural um, department, some department in California, had worked with Japanese um, people. And so he he knew Japanese people and had friends. And so when he came to Loop as the new director, he immediately began to work to close down the Loop Isolation Center and, um, you know, basically compiled information on all of the men that were there. And um, he even had, you know, he trusted, the, the men so much that he had, you know, um, Diane Suchita talks about this. Um, her grandfather was um, Paul Robertson's gardener and babysitter. And, and that's how much he trusted, um, you know, he, the, the men there at Loop. He, he had, he, he actually had them babysit his, his daughters. And, and he was, very much interested in closing down the loop isolation center because it was in an un in it creation its creation uh, and and having them in there for for no real um i mean there was really no reason to have them there and and they were there was no due process whatsoever they didn't Many of them didn't know know why they were there. They did. They didn't know when they were going to be let 
go. They had no court hearing. There was no way for them to, you know, just or ask to be let go. So he really worked hard to get all of the Japanese American um, prisoners at loop um, to finally close down that place. And he did and was successful in doing so, um, convincing the um, government officials. And, and they, you know, once they realized, I guess it was pointed out to them and by Robert and I mean, um, Paul Robertson and other um, individuals, how unjust this this isolation center was in black and white. They they were voted to close loop down. And I think I've gone way over my, my thirty minute limit. I just realized I I I see the clock now. <laughs> but um, again, this picture is in front of the the school building that was built in 1923 that Harry Wino took. And there's been some publications on the loop isolation um, history by uh, Tetsuda Kashima and um, Claudia Katayanagi recently um, uh, released her film in, in 2016. You can find it on, uh, I think, Amazon, A Bitter Legacy, and she talks about the loop isolation center in this film. So uh, with that, I, I guess I will stop and I'm sorry I went over. <laughs> you know, Davina, that's absolutely okay. I'm so glad that you shared what you did. Um, it's obvious that you have a passion for it. And um, I, we've had a steady number of people in the whole time. I think we all want to hear more. You have a few questions. Do you mind taking a couple minutes to address those? Oh yeah. Fantastic. Um, I, I think multiple people have posed questions that are uh, around this topic. So I'm going to lump them all together into one question that's, um, why do you think it is that, that the loop boarding school isolation center has not been declared um, a national historical site? Why has it not been registered as an archeological site? Um, what's behind all of that? Was, did it just go unnoticed or is there something else going on? That's a really good question. I think that, I think a lot of the um, incarceration camps, you know, they were bulldozed, you know, to, to the point where if you look, go out there and look, you don't see remnants of what was there. And that's, I feel like that, the, that the US government is literally, you know, obliterating history. And I feel that I strongly feel that in the United States, you know, even my own education, I, I, you know, went to school both on and off the Navajo reservation and um, except for the school I went to called Little Singer School, which was, was built in Bird Springs in my community to teach Navajo language and culture. The other schools, you know, public schools I attended, they didn't teach us the local history. They didn't teach us Navajo history. They never mentioned Navajo people. <laughs> and, oh. You know, I went to, I, I mean, I'm dating myself. I went to school in the seventies and eighties and, <laughs> but, you know, I, I still think that's pretty much the same case because as a college professor, I have students taking my class saying, I've never learned about Native American, contemporary Native Americans or anything about Native American people when I was growing up. So that's why I'm taking your class. I wanna learn, you know, something. I feel like I, I wasn't given that opportunity. And I think that is the case in our country where these stories of marginalized groups are not told. And, um, you know, the movie, you know, Killers of the Flower Moon, that's a story that, you know, nobody heard about until that, that movie came out. You know, there's a lot of these stories and Loop is such a unique place because it was both the boarding school and the Japanese isolation center. And ironically, which I forgot to mention too, there were code talker, Navajo code talkers that went to Loop school who were published, punished for speaking the Navajo language. I mean, the elders told me, you know, they... They were hit with switches for speaking Navajo. They were meant to eat soap 
and hold soap in their mouths for speaking Navajo, that didn't stop them from speaking Navajo. They, they just didn't speak it in front of their teachers anymore. But at the same time that students were being punished for speaking Navajo by the federal government, the federal government was also recruiting Navajo speakers because they developed, wanted them to develop a code in the Navajo language to be used against the Japanese empire during World War II. And Japanese American citizens were also being used in that same way. While they were being imprisoned in these incarceration camps across the country, their language, the, their, the Japanese speakers were also being used for their language to, oh. um, you know, for the purposes of, of uh, you know, the war against um, the Japanese empire. So, you know, the, there's these marginalized histories that really need to be um, explored and taught, um, taught about in, in um, our, our, for our education. Uh -huh. Absolutely. Um, you have a very specific question from Norma. Uh, she wants to know if, if you have any stories from the traders. Um, and apparently Norma uh, learned from Jim's store and oversaw the cleanup of the underground storage tanks in the 90s. Um, so it sounds like you've done a lot of oral history work in gathering this research. Does, is, does yeah. that name ring a bell? Um, uh, Jim store, he's, he's, um, a, Nav a, Nav a prominent Navajo uh, member of the Loop community. So I know who he is. Uh, as, as far as the traders, I haven't interviewed them. Um, uh, I, I'm, I think that there's a, a family that still li lives in Loop. Um, and it's really sad because a lot of the elders that lived during that time, the 1940s, you know, they're passing away. Even, even the elders that I interviewed you know, I, I got close to them and it's really sad, <laughs> you know, there's, it, it, you know, several of them have, have passed away. And, um, um, I know that, um, I think the traders, and I've also had, you know, a, a, I've met some descendants of the the teachers or the the staff that worked at the boarding school um, in these talks I've been give, giving, sometimes they they'll come up to me and say, "Oh, my my grandfather used to work at Loop." So you know, a lot of the staff there, um, um, you know, probably were friends with the Trading Post owners because you know they were they were white and they were you know they they got to know one another um, as um um friends i guess you could say but um it, it, one of the um trading post owners and i i thought i put the i got I, I guess i didn't put the um oops i had another letter from one of the um traders there at loop but it's not i didn't put it in my slideshow but she was asking about why the boarding school was closed in 1942 and those buildings were just sitting there um you know why did the government invest so much money into these the boarding school and now they're not doing anything with it they're not using it and um she said that she said the navajos were pacified because they said this the school closure was due to um for reasons of um, uh, the war effort, but now the buildings are just sitting there unused and it's a waste of, of money. She had written to, um, I think the Arizona Senator, Senator at that time. So it's a really interesting letter that she wrote because it, it does convey, you know, the traders were, they were often looked to by the Navajo people for, um, conveying information as well from the government to the Navajo people, because a lot of the, the local Navajos would go there to, um, you know, buy their supplies. So the traders often would 
be you know responsible for conveying information to the Navajo people mm -hmm. so it shows that they that the Navajo what she said in that letter shows that the, that the government was telling the local Navajo people there in Loop and probably Bird Springs that um they were closed the school because of you know because of the war effort mm -hmm. but they didn't say we're closing the school because we're going to use it to imprison Japanese American citizens Right, which just is pretty mind blowing. Um, Davina, you've got some other questions that are pop popping up, and I'm I would I'd like to propose this since we've reached our time plus four minutes. Um, can I collect those questions and email them to you, and then maybe have you answer them so that I can get them out to everybody? Yeah, that way, yeah. For that sure. way, we'll, we'll honor everybody's time, but we'll get those uh, questions answered. You also have had quite a few people saying thank you. This is information we want to hear, that we need to hear, that nobody did teach us. And so um, that's an important piece of what you did tonight. And I'm appreciative of that also. Um, you also have a couple of people who are interested in contacting you because they think they might have some information about Loop that you might be interested in. Um, in that email that I send out to everybody, may I send your email address so that they can contact you? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I, I, I'm totally happy to answer your question. I love to educate people. Um, and again, I'm so sorry I went over and I didn't have time to answer more questions. But yes, if you have a question, please contact me. I, I, I don't mind. Fantastic. Davina, it was delightful meeting you. Thank you for bearing with us with all of the technical difficulties. Um, everybody who joined us, thank you, thank you, thank you. We have collected all of your questions I will get them to Davina. She'll get them answered. And I'm guessing by the end of next week, we'll, we'll give you some time to get those answered. Um, we'll send you an email so that you know that. Again, the recording will be out on um, YouTube sometime in the next couple of days. And um, I'll notify you about that also. So thank you for joining us. What an amazing presentation, Davina. Thank you. Um, good luck on your book. Get it done because I think we want to read it. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me. All right, Nikki and Sarah, thank you for helping me on the back end. Good night, everybody. We'll see you next uh, next month in March for our release of the Mesa Prieta film that we're working on. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Davina.